All right, so Aviad, what do you say we kick, uh, we get this uh, webinar started? Yep, let's go, let's start. Sure. All right, so I guess uh, with that, uh, everyone, thank you for joining us uh, this evening uh, or, or, this, or this afternoon or morning, depending on where you are, uh, on the, why your next service project uh, should be using AWS AppSync. Uh, so I'm gonna be presenting along with uh, my friend here, Guy Moses, uh, who's also an engineer at uh, Lumigo. So my name's Yen. I've been uh, working with AWS uh, since uh, well, 2009, which sounds like quite a long time ago now. And I've been an AWS service hero since uh, 2018. Um, nowadays, I work as a developer advocate at the Lumigo and also do a lot of independent consulting work outside as well. And uh, Guy, as mentioned earlier, is also going to be uh, joining us on this webinar. And he's going to show you some really cool stuff when it comes to monitoring and observing your apps and APIs and uh, how you can do that with uh, Lumigo. Uh, which is what I've been doing in production uh, on quite a few of my projects, uh, including this one that I actually built uh, for a client of mine, uh, where we built a new social network. At least I built a backend in just a couple of weeks using serverless and, uh, and GraphQL. Pretty much the, the, the same stack that I've been, I guess, advocating for and also been teaching in my video course, the, the, um, the AppSync Masterclass, which you can go to uh, AppSyncMasterclass.com. Um, so, I want to start with uh, just what is uh, GraphQL and how it's different from uh, REST APIs, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with already. So GraphQL basically contains uh, two things, as the name suggests, is a query language for your APIs that lets you describe what data you have and uh, what you can do with that data. Uh, it's, but it also needs a runtime that can take a query that's written in this query language and uh, fulfill the query with the data that you have in your system. So every, every GraphQL API has got this schema that you can define uh, that defines what query and the mutation operations uh, your API supports. The queries are for reading data and mutations are for updating them. So a client is gonna send a query or a mutation uh, to a GraphQL server who then validates the request against the schema and then it's going to process the request. So there are GraphQL server implementations out there for just about every language you can think of. Uh, but uh, for this particular webinar, we're going to just talk focus on the AppSync, uh, which is a managed AWS service that basically fulfills the role of a GraphQL server. So the schema is this contract between the client and the server. And it's not just a piece of documentation that's often generated from some server-side implementation somewhere, like many of those, many of those uh, Swagger or open API specs. So uh, GraphQL schema, it doesn't just document what operations a GraphQL API supports, but it also defines them and is binding between the client and server as well. So when a client sends a request to the GraphQL server, the server is going to validate the request against the schema, and the client is not the client can't ask for data that don't exist in the schema, and the arguments is sent also have to be of the right type and so on, and then um, you can map each type or this field to what is called a resolver, which is basically the thing that's going to be responsible for fetching the data from the different databases you have, such as DynamDB or RDS or Elasticsearch, and then returns the data in the right format uh, according to what the client has asked for in the query. So whereas with REST APIs, you make this uh, HTTP request to a URL like this one here, uh, where the path follows some kind of hierarchical structure and that would lead you to the data you're looking for. And uh, typically, you know, you return a data in JSON. In this example, I want the user profile for user ID 1234. And the API is gonna take the user ID from the path and as the argument, and then it's gonna uh, return the data for me. With GraphQL, there is only one entry point for all of your requests. And the convention is to use HTTP POST and the pass the request arguments as the body, which is quite a big difference from what you would do with the rest. Another big important difference is that uh, as part of my request, I have to specify what are the fields from a profile that I want to be included in the response. And it's my responsibility as the caller to tell the server that. And since I can only ask for um, first name and the last name, uh, those are the only, so, sorry, since I'm only asking for first name and last name in, in my query here, 
those are the only fields that will be returned by the server in the response. So the same would work for if I've got like a nested field and a race. Uh, so if I've got say a user profile has got, um, um, I don't know, some a document uh, uh, object that's uh, is part of that profile and I can specify uh, what fields from that document object I want to get be included in the response. And maybe I've got an array of friends in my profile and also can say for each of the friends in that array, what fields do I want uh, to, to be included in the response? <clears throat> and uh, so that, in, that, in that case, if I want to build a say mobile app, uh, so this is uh, something that's taken from a real world example, uh, whereby which hopefully will help you sort of crystallize things a little bit in your mind. So, you know, we are building this uh, social network application where you know, people can do sports together. And as part of the app, you have a profile screen uh, where you have to show your name, your location, uh, a profile image and some sort of a you know, background image as well. And also importantly, you've got this list of uh, sports that are interesting and uh, how good I think I am at each one of them, uh, which as you can see, I'm not very good or maybe I'm just very modest. <laughs> Uh, and you can also, you also need to show a list of the activities that uh, I've organized. So if I want other people to join me for a basketball match next week, then I will create an activity in the app and then the other people will see that activity uh, if they are close to me and then they can ask to join my activity to you know, go jogging or play basketball or whatnot. And for each of these activities, uh, we want to show you know, when and where it's going to happen, how many people is going to you know, be, uh, be part of that, and so on. So imagine if I'm building the backend in the REST API, you probably start by getting the user profile. Uh, and uh, the user so profile endpoint returns a lot of data that we just don't need to display in the UI. Um, so this problem is known as overfetching, where we have to fetch data that we don't need which of course raise you know, bandwidth and the CPU cycles to on both the client and the server where we have to uh, JSON encode and the decode the data. You have to go, I guess, uh, send over the, um, over the internet uh, to, from, uh, to, from server to the client. And it wasn't that, um, it also doesn't return everything we need for the UI we just described uh, because we only get user profile. We still need everything else like the list of sports and how good I'm at each one of those and my activity. So we have to end up making additional requests to the backend to other endpoints to get the details for each sport as well as the list of activities uh, for this user and so on. Oh, I see a question in the Q&A widget and uh, almost um, I forgot to mention that if you've got any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A widget uh, rather than the chat so that uh, we can we have an easier way to curate those. Um, right, so you make, uh, have to make more requests to the backend to get the information you need in order to render the whole UI page you've got. So this creates additional round trip between the client and the server and it's not and it's not something that you can always do in parallel, uh, which of course is going to add even more delay to how quickly we're able to get all the data we need on the client to be able to render that UI page, which of course is going to hurt the user experience the longer it's going to take to do everything. So this is known as underfetching and N plus one request problem, which is another source of inefficiency and the waste when it comes to building applications. So to, uh, to mitigate some of these problems, very common pattern that has been, I guess, uh, has been, uh, uh, people has, has emerged uh, is called BFFs or backends for front ends. Essentially, you've got you know, front end teams that are, uh, that, that are responsible for individual API, uh, um, uh, sort of app pages. They will create dedicated APIs for just what that page needs so that uh, they will have a backend for front end which would uh, basically act as a proxy to other API so that uh, you can do those uh, uh, requests to multiple APIs and reduce the number of round trips between the client and the server. So from the, from the client's perspective, you're making one request to one API that gets you everything you need to render this API page. Even though behind the scenes, there are multiple requests to different APIs and different databases, but those are happening between, uh, between um, services, which doesn't have to go the whole round trip between the, between the client and the server. So they'll be a lot more efficient. And it also helps mitigate some of those impact you have with overfetching, whereby you, can only, you only need to return data that the front end actually needs for that particular page. Um, but you, with, with, with this approach, you end up creating a lot of different uh, bespoke 
BFFs, which becomes a bit of a maintenance headache. And you also end up doing the same work multiple times, uh, potentially maybe even duplicating the same code between different BFFs, uh, as well as any you know, business logic that you, uh, that you need to have in those BFFs, as well as potentially uh, duplicating some of the logic that you already have in your backend APIs. So with GraphQL, that's essentially no need to write bespoke BFFs every time you need to work on a new UI page uh, since the client um, have a lot more expressive power when it comes to asking for what data they need and only get back the data they actually need uh, for a particular page. So to implement the same UI using GraphQL, uh, I can just ask for all the data I need for this page in a single GraphQL request where as an authenticated user, I can ask for my profile and specify that in the response. I want my ID, the, my first name, last name, gender, and so on. And the GraphQL server is gonna fetch all of those from a profile table in DynamoDB. Uh, and then for each of the sports, I can say, I want the display name for the sport as well as an image URL. Um, but remember, this is uh, something that is referenced from my profile and uh, the list of, uh, of the list of sports in the profile, we don't want to duplicate those information on every single profile object we create. And so, so that uh, when we want to update, say the display name or image URL that we want to use for sport, we have to go and find all the user profiles that reference them. So instead the profile object would just contain an ID for the sport uh, so that we can then change those fields about the sport quickly. And so in this case, uh, we're going to have to get the display name and image URL for the sport from a different table, from the sports table, uh, which is kind of like a join you have in the relational databases where we can join by these two uh, ID fields. And then the select, I can, and then, uh, and then from that uh, sport table, I can select just the display name and the image URL. Um, so GraphQL is going to handle all of that for us and uh, map those fields for individual sports to a separate uh, resolver and the fetch them from the sports table in DynamoDB. So we are good. Um, so there's no need for the client to send separate requests and uh, save us some of those, those additional round trips that uh, I talked about earlier, uh, which it would be necessary if I was to build this whole thing in the rest. So as for my activities, since I can have uh, many, many activities, uh, so these are not stored in the user profile either. They are stored in a separate table away from my profile, but each activity has got a user ID. So I can very quickly find my activities by looking up my user ID and do a query against this activity table. So we can associate this activities field on the profile type in the GraphQL schema to a different resolver, which would then fetch the activities from the activity table by running a DynamDB query. And then it's gonna get back the activities uh, that belongs to me, or at least are created by me. And for each of those activities that I came back, you can also expand those uh, nested objects. So these individual activities, I can expand them to, to, to get the, uh, the first name and profile image for other users who have asked to join my basketball match next week, uh, which will be coming from the profile table as well, where all the user profile data is. So as you can see, this is all very, very flexible. The client can basically ask for any information they need in a single query Within the, con within the constraints that's defined by my schema. So it solves the problem of overfetching and underfetching and the client can basically ask for everything they need or nothing more, nothing less. Uh, and the GraphQL schema itself is a, is a strongly typed contract between the client and the server, uh, which can also double as both request and response validation. So there's no need for me to do any additional requests or response validation based on uh, the schema that's all taken care of for us by the GraphQL server implementation. And the client can't ask for data that is not exposed in the schema and the backend code I've got also can't return any data that's not included in the schema as well, which makes it a lot harder for any attackers to try to steal data from our system that was never intended to be returned from the back from the API. As we've seen a lot of uh, attacks against the systems where the attacker is able to steal data that the API was never meant to return because there's no response validation on the backend API. So again, that's something that you just get out of the box when it comes to GraphQL. Um, and also sales solves one of the pain points of using no, um, no, no SQL databases like DynamoDB where 
there's no joins and you have to typically do those joins in your own application code. So here, GraphQL and by extension, AppSync, uh, takes care of all of that for you. Um, so with all things considered, I think GraphQL just makes it much easier for you to build a data-driven application and uh, it enables front-end teams to really quickly and uh, to uh, really quickly iterate on the product and user experience. And it has become my default choice for building new applications. Uh, and I hope that by the end of this webinar, uh, you'll feel the same as well, especially given just how easy it is to do it nowadays uh, using AppSync, which is uh, scalable and uh, performant GraphQL API um, server, a managed GraphQL server uh, that, um, that's, that's provided by AWS. It's fully managed, so you can you know, it lets you, you know, it, and it auto uh, auto scales, and uh, uh, you don't have to run any servers yourself or any you know, clusters of uh, uh, of uh, containers, uh, and uh, it also gives you multi z redundancy out of the box as well. So AppSync you know, does the job of the GraphQL server, and it's responsible for processing those requests and then mapping different parts of the request to a different resolver, which are then responsible for fetching data from different data sources. So AppSync supports five data sources out of the box. Uh, you have um, um, AppSync resolvers that, that can send the HTTP request to basically any HTTP endpoint. So it's a really good way for you to put GraphQL in front of existing REST APIs. Uh, so you can keep those existing UI pages where they are, talking to their own BFFs, uh, as in you know, backends for frontends. Uh, or maybe those uh, pages would go straight to your backend APIs, uh, however you've got them set up right now. But then as you start to work on a new UI page, uh, they can use a new AppSync API instead, which will then uh, forward those requests to your existing REST APIs using HTTP Resolver. And then over time, you can gradually migrate those existing pages to use the AppSync API instead of these, uh, their, their bespoke BFFs. And then in time, you can deprecate those, uh, those BFFs so that everything will go through your AppSync API. And at that point, you might also decide to simplify how you organize your backend APIs. Um, if most of them are just doing basic CRUD against the, say, DynamDB, uh, then you might decide that, well, the REST API layer is, is itself, they are just not adding much value. Uh, it's been much easier for us to just go straight from AppSync to those tables. And uh, especially if uh, all of those tables are owned by the same team anyway, then they have to change in the uh, in, in tandem with the uh, uh, the GraphQL schema and all that. And the uh, DynamDB is is you no, know, it's just one of the um, and DynamDB is also one of the other resolvers of so data sources that's supported by AppSync out of the box, um, which also supports uh, RDS uh, or relational databases. Um, sorry, relational database service. Uh, from AWS is also worth noting at, that, at this point that, uh, <coughs> oops, sorry, um, that the apps integration with RDS only works with uh, data API for Aurora serverless database. So not all RDS databases um, types are supported. So in fact, I think uh, as of right now, uh, RDS or uh, serverless Aurora uh, V2 still doesn't have a data API yet. So I don't think it's actually supported by AppSync. So if anyone knows different, uh, please let me know. And if you need to do full text search, then AppSync also integrates with uh, Elasticsearch, uh, which is the Amazon hosted uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, you can map those uh, GraphQL operations straight to a Elasticsearch uh, query, which is uh, very useful if you need to build some search features in your application, even though I think with Elasticsearch, there's still a lot more operational overhead, um, things that I don't like to do very much, uh, like maintaining and managing that uh, Elasticsearch cluster and updating the uh, clusters uh, Elasticsearch engine version and so on. So I actually more and more now, I tend to use another service uh, called Algolia instead, whenever I need to do search in my API, so in my app. Um, anything else, you can also always have uh, Lambda functions instead, where you can write Lambda function that connects your AppSync API to just about anything else you can think of. Uh, it could be other API services, so API services, or other SaaS application uh, services like uh, Algolia, which I just mentioned, uh, which I think is great when it comes to uh, building search features in the apps. 
So AppSync itself is uh, very scalable. Um, the, uh, you, there's no limit on how many uh, requests, uh, well, how many users can, uh, you, you can handle. The GraphQL subscription implementation also supports millions of uh, connected clients at the same time. And uh, your AppSync API is also deployed to multiple availability zones out of the box, which uh, gives you a really good the baseline when it comes to resilience so that you're not vulnerable to uh, availability zone wide uh, failures or data center wide uh, failures. And the nice thing is that you only pay for what you use. Uh, the cost is about $4 per million query or mutation operations. So even if um, apps have to run multiple resolvers for a single query and the fetch data from different places, that still counts as one operation. So whereas uh, with REST APIs and API Gateway, uh, because of the under fetching problem, the equivalent thing you'll be doing in, uh, will, be, will translate to at least a couple of HTTP requests to API Gateway to hit different APIs to get the user profile, then to get the list of sports, and then to get the list of activities for those uh, sport uh, for those uh, uh, for that for that user, and maybe and uh, to fetch individual uh, users information that has asked to join this uh, activity and so on. So you end up, you can, even though per million requests on API Gateway is cheaper on paper, uh, because of the fact that you've got this uh, under fetching problem, you have to make multiple requests. So you may still find your API to be cheaper with AppSync because of the fact that it's multiple requests all condensed into one GraphQL operation and you pay $4 uh, per million operations, not individual uh, requests you make uh, you to fetch data from your uh, databases. And then with uh, GraphQL, every request goes through the same entry point. So you can't you know, just cache everything by the URL. Um, so there's no, you, know, you can't do, just do caching at the cloud front for that matter. Um, but luckily, AppSync has got some built-in caching support, which works very similar to uh, API Gateway caching, where essentially you're paying for uh, like an hourly rate for some memcached node which AppSync manages for you. So you don't have to worry about the, you know, running the cluster. You just have to say, okay, what size of the cache node um, do I want for my API? And then the AppSync kind of manages that for you. And the nice thing with the caching here is that you can either cache the entire request uh, or you can say, okay, you know what? The whole request, I want to get some, you know, some data should always be fresh from a database. Uh, but, uh, but other parts like uh, the sports name and the image URL, that doesn't really change very often. So AppSync allows you to you know, mix and match here. And the good uh, caching strategy would be to, um, to, to use caching uh, on things that doesn't, that doesn't change very often, like the sports image, date, image and the data, uh, or maybe when you're fetching other users, the uh, first name and profile name, which uh, you don't, you know, you wouldn't care if they were to change their profile image and you don't have to get the latest image right away, it's okay to cache it as to, to some extent. So a good caching strategy that, uh, you know, that chooses where to apply caching can make a huge difference in terms of performance and scalability and cost as well, especially when you're running, running at even a moderate amount of scale. So. We can talk a bit more about that. You guys got specific questions about caching. Uh, so just put something in the, in the Q&A and uh, we can get to that later. Um, as AppSync also has got built-in integration with uh, monitoring and logins through CloudWatch metrics and the CloudWatch logs. So you can get this a lot of high level metrics like number of API requests, uh, error count, latency and all that, which is great. Um, but unfortunately, all of these are aggregated at the API level. So you can't tell how well individual resolvers is doing and uh, where there's an error, uh, which operation or which resolver is the actual problem. So to get more information about what's actually happening on the request, uh, you want to enable logging. At least for the dev environment, uh, you can set the field resolver log level to all, uh, which is gonna give you a lot of information about what's going on inside the resolver and how well each resolver is actually doing. So uh, Guy is going to talk you to you a little bit more about different options you have here and uh, also what Lumigo can do for you in this case that uh, the built-in logging and the uh, metrics from uh, AWS uh, can't do. 
for debugging performance issues, you can also look at the enabling X-ray as well, which uh, you know, gives you a much, I guess, a visual sense in terms of what's actually happening, uh, how many, say, DynamoDB requests that you are making from the AppSync API, and which one of them are executed in sequence, and which ones are executed in parallel, and so on. Um, it gives you this uh, high-level service map view as well. We can see the different services your, your, your API talks to, but uh, given the fact that most APIs talk to a lot of different things, uh, I don't usually find this to be particularly useful because you're just going to be way too many things in one screen uh, without the proper ways to sort of navigate and, and narrow things down. Um, so that's kind of where you know, Lumigo comes in. And uh, again, the guy is going to show you what Lumigo can do for you and how much easier it's going to make your life uh, when you're working with AppSync. Um, and also, uh, finally, AppSync is, uh, gives me all of this, and you don't have to manage any servers, uh, so you can get a lot more things done than I could otherwise. And comparing to API Gateway, which I think I'm sure most of you are more familiar with, um, we've seen some of the inherent advantages that uh, GraphQL has over REST, but there's also a few things that, that AppSync specifically does really, really well compared to API Gateway on top of all the benefits that you get uh, for with just using GraphQL to begin with. So we talked about caching, we talked about the monitoring and the AppSync supports the WebSockets through GraphQL subscriptions, uh, integrates with uh, AWS WAF, uh, lets you configure, so which lets you configure firewall rules for your API. It's got some built-in rules you may want to enable like blocking suspicious IP addresses or requests that are missing the authentication header. Uh, and uh, you can configure IP rate-based rate limiting and all that as well. Um, so it can, you know, it's quite useful for blocking those naive uh, denial service attacks uh, from script kiddies. And for example, um, it's got also integration with, obviously we've seen DynamoDB, uh, RDS, uh, uh, Lambda, Elasticsearch, as well as HTTP resolvers to integrate with uh, other existing REST APIs. In terms of authentication, it supports cognito user pools, AWS IAM, API keys, and OpenID Connect. Uh, so if you want to work with any so OIDC compliance services, uh, that's all going to work. And API Gateway, on the other hand, also has got more or less the same thing, caching and monitoring WebSockets, uh, WAF supports, and it's got integration with uh, more, well, a lot more AWS services. Uh, uh, you can basically proxy your request to just about every other uh, AWS service that exposes a REST endpoint. Um, but you do tend to have to write a bit of a custom VTL code if you want to do that. Um, so most of the time I actually find people just end up using Lambda instead uh, because it's just easier to write code in say Node or Python than to write the VTL. Um, but uh, there are some benefits for using API Gateway with uh, service proxies, uh, which are covered in separate blog posts. Uh, so feel free to read about this later. Uh, we will distribute the slides so that you have the link to this blog post as well. Um, authentication wise, API Gateway supports all the same options that AppSync does, uh, plus some more. It supports uh, Lambda Authorizer, uh, so very useful for implementing custom authentication logic. And uh, API Gateway's uh, API key also supports uh, rate limiting and quotas uh, through usage plans, which is again useful uh, for SaaS applications where you often need to limit how many requests a particular client can make per month and all that. Uh, supports custom domains, uh, which AppSync doesn't do natively right now. Uh, and you can also create private endpoints that are only accessible to your own VPC, which AppSync doesn't do right now. Uh, and finally, API Gateway supports a resource policy as well, which is something that AppSync also doesn't do. Um, so in terms of overall, overall feature set, API Gateway has got a bit more uh, compared to AppSync, but um, Quite a few of the, it's also got quite a few useful features that uh, AppSync doesn't have yet. But there's a couple of things that AppSync does a lot better compared to API Gateway. For example, when it comes to implementing any kind of a group-based authentication where you've got potential different roles in your application and you want to limit the different roles to different actions in your API, in your API um, uh, like for example, read only the users can only do, you know, reads, they can't do any writes. So within Cognito, you can create groups and then put users in those groups that represent different roles. You can then associate each role with an IEM role and then a, and a precedence value for basically selecting which group to apply to for permissions if a user is in the multiple groups. Uh, however, when you're using Cognito Authorizer with API Gateway, 
this whole IAM role and precedence, it just doesn't work automatically. It's not something that uh, API Gateway is going to do for you. And instead, API Gateway only checks if the user belongs to the user pool. It doesn't do any further checks against the groups or use the IAM roles as associated with groups in any way. So to implement group-based authentication, you have to do it yourself. So you have to assign IAM role to each group to control which endpoint the user can access. And then you have to make sure the, the presence values is set correctly so you can pick the most appropriate group if a user belongs to multiple groups. And then you have to write a Lambda authorizer, and that's right, to implement the group-based authentication with uh, Cognito, you have to actually use a Lambda authorizer and not Cognito because you need to write custom authentic authentication logic here. And the Lambda authorizer needs to check the authentication tokens against the Cognito to make sure it's actually, you know, belongs to the, to the user pool and then get the user detail you, uh, so that get the user's information from Cognito so you know which groups the user belongs to. And then based on the precedence of those groups, you pick a group for the user and then you generate IAM policy based on the IAM role that's associated with that group. So if it sounds complicated, it's because it is, is, is hard work. Uh, no two ways about that. Um, in AppSync, group-based authentication with Cognito is basically built in. You can just say in your schema, what groups can perform an action and that's it done. It's uh, pretty much self-explanatory and uh, almost takes uh, no effort whatsoever. Another requirement that I've seen pop up a lot is the uh, request and response validation. So API Gateway does support request validation. You need to specify in your schema uh, for an endpoint, uh, what's the uh, request model. And if a request doesn't meet that, uh, that schema, then the uh, API gateway would, re would uh, reject the request and you're not gonna pay for the request, which is a good way for you to protect yourself against some naive uh, uh, attacks. But there's no response validation. Even though you could, with API gateway, specify a response model as well as a request model, but that response model is only used when API gateway generates um, those uh, auto-generated uh, API spec for your API. It doesn't use it for any, any, form of, any form of a validation. So typically to implement the request validation, you have to do it yourself in your own code uh, using maybe something like uh, MIDI, which is a middleware engine for Node.js functions, which is a language specific solution. And uh, it might not be an equivalent for uh, other languages. And response validation is also often overlooked. Uh, it's actually, but it's actually a really important tool for preventing any kind of data leak or, um, or attacks. Uh, for example, you know, if we just read an object from DB and return everything, then maybe there are data points that shouldn't be returned like date of birth or address or credit card numbers or anything as a PII. Uh, so if an attacker has, you know, or maybe if an attacker executes uh, some kind of a SQL injection attack against you and you know, trick your API into doing a select all from a database and return everything uh, in the database, then the, again, uh, response validation is going to be a really helpful way for you to stop the data from actually being returned by the API. And security is uh, as much about what your application should do as to what it shouldn't do. And it's entirely possible for you to do a really good job of a request and response validation using API Gateway. But once again, it's just hard work and it's easy and it's easy to forget, especially when it's something that you have to spend a lot of effort into implementing yourself. And with GraphQL and AppSync, uh, request and response validation is basically built into how GraphQL works. The client just can't ask for anything that's not on a schema anyway. And the server also can't return any data that's not on a schema. So uh, if I've got data for say a user profile that I don't want to show other people like my date of birth, uh, which is often used as a password in the in really poorly, uh, uh, in poor uh, password choices uh, people make. So in this case, uh, uh, so when, I, when I'm going to the app I, I, and I, f I look at my own profile, I want to see those private data. But when other people see my profile in the app, they, I don't want them to see those information. So uh, what I can do is in this case is create two separate types. Uh, one that is returned when a user fetches his own profile and the other is used when we need to return this user's profile and present it to other users in the case of say uh, search results or when you see an activity you want to join and you want to see who else is, uh, is going to be playing basketball, you're going to be playing basketball with. 
So we can limit the subset of information that gets exposed publicly versus information that gets returned by the user uh, for the user who's uh, viewing his own profile. Uh, and also in terms of WebSockets, both AppSync and API Gateway support WebSockets, but the developer experience uh, with them are very, very different. So API Gateway has had the WebSocket support since about 2018. And the way it works is that when someone, someone connects to your uh, WebSockets API, you have to have a Lambda function handle to handle the uh, on connect event. And, and uh, if you want to use that connection later, uh, say to send a message to a user, then you have to recall the client, the, sorry, the connection ID somewhere yourself, maybe in a DB table. And if you're building, say, like a chat app um, where you want to send uh, push invocations to everybody in a group, whenever one of the group members sends a new message, then the, you need to map those connection IDs against the group ID as well. And uh, equally, when a user disconnects from your WebSockets API, you have to use a Lambda function to handle that event and then to update your records in DynamDB accordingly. So that when you need to send a message to a WebSocket connection, you have to first get it from DynamDB where you've got it saved in the, uh, from the on-connect handler. And then you have to make a request to API Gateway to say, oh, please send this message to this connection ID. So as you can see, this is a very low level construct where you have to basically manage the connection IDs and in order to be able to send message to them later. Um, and there are no built-in support for broadcasts. So if you need to broadcast messages to millions of connected users, then you have to first basically get all the connection IDs out of your database and then make what millions of API calls to API gateway to, because you can only send one message to one connection ID per request. So if you need to broadcast that this is super inefficient and it's not gonna scale well at all. Um, that being said, I think API gateway is a web is still fine for simple use cases where you just need to send messages to a small group of users at a time, for example, for like one-to-one -one private chats, uh, or maybe even group chat where you've got some hard limit on the size of the group. Uh, but overall, I, st I still find it to be fairly limited. And on the other hand, the WebSockets in AppSync is, is basically a breeze to work with. It's all sort of implemented around the uh, web uh, GraphQL subscriptions, uh, which you can define as, uh, as part of your GraphQL schema. So first you define a mutation operation in the top level mutation type to say, capture the, the, uh, the updates you want to send and, uh, and notify any of your subscribers via WebSockets. So, and then you define a top level subscription type and add the things the client can subscribe to. In this case, I want the client to be able to subscribe to when the new post has been posted. Uh, and so I connect the subscription with the mutation that adds a new post so that when a client subscribes to this uh, added post subscription, uh, then every time I make a mutation to add a new post, the result of that uh, mutation, which is a post object, would then be sent and forwarded to the subscription. And then that gets broadcast to all the subscribers who have subscribed to this uh, subscription. You can add arguments to the subscription operation so that it allows the subscribers to basically decide what events to subscribe to. Rather than having to receive every single update, I can say only send me updates uh, for a particular uh, event ID or a particular author who has uh, created a new post and so on. And so it's just, you know, it's just much easier to work with compared to API Gateway. And the fact that there's also a higher level, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a higher level construct and it supports a broadcast out of the box. It just makes it much easier to build applications and you know, build features on top of that. When you don't have to worry about underlying um, scaling and the dealing with the underlying connections yourself. Uh, and you can also scale that uh, to having millions of connected clients. Uh, so it's also suitable for even some, some of the more demanding applications out there as well. Um, that being said, you couldn't actually use API Gateway with AppSync together. It's one way for you to say add support for uh, Lambda authorizers or usage plans or even custom domain names for AppSync, which otherwise doesn't support them. And the last one I want to touch on quickly is that uh, um, before I hand you over to Guy, is that the uh, AppSync is not the only way to run GraphQL APIs using serverless technologies. It's also possible for you to do this by just running you know, GraphQL server inside a Lambda function. 
Uh, and you typically do this by running, say, a Polar server in the Lambda function behind API Gateway endpoints. And you can write your own resolvers to connect to you know, your, your, your graph, GraphQL queries uh, to DynamDB, RDS, or you know, whatever else you want to use. And I do see a lot of people doing this still, even though they could have used the AppSync instead. And the good question is, uh, well, you know, why? Why go through all the trouble of writing a GraphQL server and uh, writing those resolvers yourself when there's a managed service that does it all for you? I think sometimes um, the reason is that uh, you need some of the GraphQL features that just aren't supported by AppSync yet, uh, even though they may you know, offer, uh, even though AppSync may offer a lot of uh, you know, benefits like caching and uh, you know, direct integration with other AWS services. Uh, but it doesn't support, and it, and it does support most of the GraphQL features, um, you know, like the green bits here in, in the middle here. Uh, but if you want to, you know, make do with um, the GraphQL features, well, sorry, if you want, and but you have to make do without uh, uh, the graph, uh, GraphQL features you want, uh, which are missing in the AppSync, or you have to implement them yourself somehow, uh, if it's even possible. In most cases, it's not uh, features like uh, GraphQL features like custom scalar types, uh, which is not possible for you to implement it yourself with AppSync. And uh, GraphQL has got a number of you know, built-in scalar for, um, you know, or I guess primitive data types, if you like, for flows and IDs and stuff like that. And AppSync's got a whole bunch more for things like JSON, date, date time, email, URL, and so on. Uh, but you can't define your own uh, your custom scalar types, which is something that you have to do yourself uh, by running a GraphQL or so a Polar server in Lambda so that you can define custom scalar types for things like longitude and the latitude, uh, which is a very common use case for custom scalar types. Um, and then um, there's also VTO, uh, which is the template language that you have to use with AppSync. Uh, it's got its own learning curves and definitely not everyone's cup of tea. Uh, in fact, I don't think Many, I don't think most people like it. Uh, there's only like one or two people I know that actually enjoys writing VTO. Um, but very soon you won't be able to, you, you won't have to write VTO anymore with AppSync uh, because uh, AWS is, uh, has announced their intention to release uh, uh, JavaScript support as, uh, as another template language that you can use with AppSync for, for writing those uh, resolver queries. Uh, but I think the big one, though, is that uh, when it comes to why not AppSync, uh, is that right now it doesn't support the schema uh, stitching, uh, which is which is something that a lot of companies end up wanting as they uh, as they grow and have more and more teams. Uh, so, schema federation in the Polo is basically a way for you to stitch multiple GraphQL APIs together. Uh, under uh, under a one sort of entry point, one API surface, so so that you avoid having mo having a like monolithic GraphQL API, uh, and is able to then compose things together. It's a sort of feature that uh, really useful for larger companies, uh, you know, where you got different teams that want to own their part of the schema, uh, but they want to have and they want to have the autonomy to update their own service and schema definition but still present like one API service to the caller. So similar to how just GraphQL APIs normally works, how you would interpret a GraphQL request and then offload different parts of the query to um, different resolvers to get data from you know, one table, from different table, and then, uh, and then stitch them together in one response. Federation basically adds like a gateway in front of all of your GraphQL APIs so it's able to then stitch the schema from all the different APIs together into a sort of like a super schema. And it's able to then delegate different parts of the query to the relevant GraphQL API, uh, which then delegate part of you know, their slice of the query to their own resolvers and so on. It's, um, it's a very nice system, uh, but it also has some additional complexities to make sure that those individual schemas, they don't overlap. Uh, and that when you update one of the um, schemas, one of the constituent schemas, you have to rebuild the entire federation or super schema as well. And many people in the AppSync community argue that it's complexity that's just not worth it. Uh, but I think the API, the, the AppSync team is actively looking to how can they introduce some, some kind of a federation capability into AppSync, because this is something that many, many companies are asking for. Um, so if you don't, so right now, if you want to scale your AppSync API, you kind of have to go the, 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 um, the, the rest approach whereby uh, you have your client application and you just have multiple AppSync APIs and then you just talk to multiple APIs together. 
which then the, you know, I guess you have the same problem with the sort of n plus one request problem with this approach, whereby you have, you know, if those, uh, those uh, domains are not entirely self-contained, uh, that you have to often reference one from the other, then that becomes problematic as well. So if you're running, you know, graph here in the Lambda function, um, you also have to replicate all the things that Appsyn gives you in terms of the direct integration with uh, DAMDB, with Elasticsearch and RDS, uh, and HTTP requests. And you also have to implement, uh, this is probably more than one of the more interesting ones because you have to implement your own caching and uh, manage the cache nodes yourself as well as the, um, the Lambda function that runs your resolver and then uh, the, the, uh, the resolver logging. And probably a big thing that you lose out as well is the built-in support with, uh, for group-based authentication with Cognito. Um, but you no, know, running a GraphQL server in Lambda does give you a lot more control in terms of how the request is handled. And uh, although you have to implement it yourself, you know, it can be reasonably easy to implement the per resolver metrics and request count and things like that, because a lot of the GraphQL server implementations already, already do that. And uh, you can also add the uh, custom middlewares to take care of some of those uh, cross cutting concerns like uh, tracing and so on. So it's probably not as big a task. Um, so I do see a lot of people still running, you know, doing this setup where they're running their own uh, Polar server, mainly because they needed some GraphQL uh, uh, feature or most likely they needed to have a schema federation. All right, so using uh, API Gateway also means that you can, you, you can use uh, um, uh, API Gateway's uh, usage plans and other and API keys and Lambda authorizers and so on. Uh, so that becomes easier for you to integrate with uh, third party uh, of providers like of zero and things like that. Um, and you can always, uh, sorry, you can always uh, put uh, API Gateway in front of AppSync as well. Uh, so you can leverage the same features that you have with API Gateway, but is missing in AppSync. Um, one downside of using, okay, one, one more downside for using uh, running GraphQL server in the Lambda function is that uh, you have to deal with Lambda code starts and your function requires a, a big kind of like a big uh, dependency for the GraphQL server itself, uh, as well all the dependencies it needs to talk to every single data source. So that can potentially have impact on the latency of your user request that uh, hits a code start. Uh, whereas with uh, AppSync, if you're doing AppSync integration with, say, DynamDB or Elasticsearch directly, then you don't have to go through Lambda functions, and therefore, there's just one less thing for you to worry about. Uh, in this case, your function is probably going to have uh, fewer code starts, uh, and the code starts faster as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's all about balance as with four things, and you have to find the right, the right balance for your particular project uh, between what's missing in AppSync and the, how much it would take you to implement uh, those features yourself uh, versus uh, the time and effort you're gonna have to spend on replicating the things that AppSync gives you out of the box. And my you know, personal rule of thumb is to always use AppSync uh, if I can, until I can't, until there are specific GraphQL features that are absolutely need and that AppSync doesn't, doesn't support it. Um, then the, yeah, sure, I have to you know, figure out a way to migrate from uh, AppSync to running those GraphQL uh, servers on Lambda. And with that, uh, let's uh, go into how we can uh, monitor and uh, debug problems with AppSync APIs. And I'm gonna hand it over to Guy who can do you, uh, tell you all about that. Yes, um, thank you, Jan. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay. So, um, you can see the slides, right? So, uh, uh, hi everyone. My name is uh, is Guy. I'm a member of Flamigos. Um, um, I'm going to show you how you can gain better. I truly believe that by the end of the next few slides, you'll get a sense of how you can um, debug your apps application more easily. So. Um, what we're going to be covering today is um, basically three things. Um, sh why should you monitor your AppSync? And I mean, um, you should. And um, what's AWS is giving you out of the box, which is um, metrics and logging, and also um, the cloud, which is Jan showed before. And then I want to show you um, what we've created here in Lumigo and how we think that um, debugging and tracing um, AppSync should be done. So um, 
you can think you, you can think of AppSync as a normal web server that answers um, requests. Um, protocol times one of the requests will, or maybe you'll get a sense that a user is experiencing um, latencies. And um, for that reason, AppSync. And this is the reason um, why AWS released its own um, metrics and logging way to, um, to see your AppSync. And um, first, um, what you would want to look for is the metrics that are available um, in the in the AppSync um, application. And what AWS is giving you is overall health. Um, just like Jan showed before, they're giving you the, um, the graph of the total requests and also um, latencies, the requests latencies, um, and also the graph for the 400 errors and the 500 errors, um, which gives you a great sense of what's going on in the platform. That are available the um, the WebSocket metrics. Once you find um, error, then you would go to the settings to the settings tab in your AppSync application. You will enable your logs. It's pretty easy. And um, there's a couple of options here. You can even um, include verbose content, which says that um, to your logging, you'll log the request headers and also the response headers, as well as the context and some other values. And so, um, hey, uh, Guy. I, hey, uh, you. you're, you're very choppy. I think there's a, an issue with the Wi-Fi. So I suggest that maybe we take a break with, uh, with the, this part. And uh, Jan, maybe you want to answer some of the questions that are in the Q and A. Yeah, sure. Uh, so let's do that uh, while guys uh, see if we can sort out his uh, Wi-Fi connection. Um, so I've got a question here from um, uh, from Craig. Uh, do you have any tips for writing resolvers in the VTO? Um, IDE support isn't very good. Uh, that's true. And the testing and debugging VTOs through CDK deployment is slow. So. Um, uh, going to do a quick plug on my video course, Absent Masterclass. Uh, so what you could actually do is uh, uh, the Amplify uh, project actually releases uh, a number of the open source uh, tools that you can download um, to simulate some you know, you know, VTL to a certain extent. So what I often do is uh, to test my VTL code, uh, anything that's well, I don't tend to do all of them. I tend to uh, do some unit tests for Things away, I'm writing custom custom logic. If I'm just doing like a direct, you know, to get item from DAM, DB, and you know, things like that, I don't tend to write unit tests for them because it just uh, you know, a lot of it is just you know getting the the, the um, uh, a template for example from the uh, DAM DB resolvers uh, documentation page and then you know, change the fields to match my table schema. Um, but if I'm writing it in a custom logic, validation logic, and things like that, then I often write a unit test and then use those amplifiers, uh, uh, tools to or libraries to simulate a VTL engine, and then the validate the output uh, or uh, validate the the errors being thrown and things like that. Um, that way. I don't have to wait until I do a deployment and then check if my VTL logic is correct. Another thing you could do, uh, if you don't want to rely on automated testing, is that uh, you can um, actually edit the VTL in the AppSync console, which has got a lot better IDE support. <laughs> uh, you can actually get syntax, uh, syntax autocomplete uh, and the highlighting and things like that in the AppSync console. 
And then the, as you change things, you can save the, the resolver and then you run your, your AppSync query in the AppSync console uh, or in your application and you can see what happens. So those are the two main ways I tend to do a lot of the sort of editing and the, um, uh, testing for my resolvers, uh, VTL resolvers. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, Craig. Uh, feel free to sort of follow up with another question if uh, you, uh, if, uh, you've, got, you've, got, you've got anything to follow up. Um, okay, Guy, are you ready to do it again? Yes, uh, I've had my internet connection problems. Um, I think I fixed it now. Okay, cool. All right, I'll leave it to you then. Um, sure. So um, I hope that you, um, whereas I was in the logging um, slide, and what I wanted to show here is that um, AWS gives you um, almost out of the box the ability to um, to see the detailed logs out of your AppSync requests. They, if you enable your logs in the settings in the AppSync, um, and then if you include also verbose content for the request headers and response headers, um, you can start to see um, logging of your AppSync, which will actually be logged for every request um, of AppSync. And that's why maybe sometimes it would be too much and you would want to um, include, to not include the field resolver, the resolver log level which is why AWS gave you the option here to choose maybe to um, to to see also only the um, the error log level. And so once you um, once you enable the logs, you can go into your CloudWatch and you'll see um, a log group created for your API for the AppSync application. And then you'll start seeing um, logs that looks like this, which includes the, um, the latencies and the status codes of your requests. And also, if you include the options that um, I've showed you before, then you will you will even see the GraphQL query that you ran, um, and you will see oops, and you will see um, the request headers and the response headers. And if you enable the tracing, then you'll see the detailed uh, result per resolver log level. And so um, this is where it gets complicated. And the reason that it gets complicated is that um, each AppSync request is probably made of several. Um, resolvers, which each interacts with a different AWS service or just, you know, a random HTTP call to somewhere. And then um, your response will probably look like something like this. You'll have a 200 status code, which means that in the GraphQL layer, everything went good. But um, if one of your um, resolvers failed, maybe raised an exception or something like that, AppSync won't fail your request. And you'll, you won't see something like, um, you know, your 500 um, status code or 400 for, for maybe an authorized exception, you'll see um, your schema and you'll see um, the resolvers and in the, in the place where the resolver failed, you'll see the null here. And so this is why it gets complicated when, when we're speaking of um, tracing and getting to know your, your problems with your lambdas. And um, this is why um, we in Lumigo implemented something that will help you trace your AppSync application. So just a couple of things about Lumigo. Lumigo does um, pretty much serverless monitoring and debugging for many, many services, including DynamoDB, Lambdas, and API gateways, SNS, SQS, Kinesis, and more. Um, you should definitely check this out if you haven't, um, if you haven't uh, tried Lumigo. And today, I'm going to talk specifically about AppSync which is a feature that I've worked on. So for the AppSync, um, what's crazy about this feature is that you don't have to um, implement any agent, you don't have to change any configuration, and you have the, both the logs and the metrics in one place. So again, you don't have to really touch your code or do anything. Lumigo just wraps your service and um, lets you see uh, things that you weren't aware of before. So for the demo, I've already created here an AppSync application and um, three resolvers, two lambdas, and one DynamoDB. The lambdas are pretty simple. It's just um, just a regular lambda that sleeps for one second and then returns um, just a simple object here. And then the second lambda, what it does is sleeps for three seconds and then raises an exception, says boom. Um, and let's for the demo, use the same uh, request that you've seen before. I'm going to call the get lambda one, get lambda two, and DynamoDB. And again, we're going to expect to get um, this request, which uh, which really, if you weren't looking for the problem here, you wouldn't know that you had a problem. And this is why Lumigo helps you to solve this problem. 
And uh, let me show you the demo in Lumigo. So um, for those of you who haven't seen Lumigo ever, this is the, um, the main page. This is a dashboard. Gives you great details about um, many services as well as lambdas and uh, maybe also the call starts and service latencies and things like that. But um, today I wanna show you specifically the AppSync page. In the AppSync page, what we're showing um, to begin with is all of your APIs and the sum of the requests and errors happening. Um, you can change, you know, the time uh, frequent, the time period here. And for this webinar, let's um, drill down and see the requests that happened in the AppSync webinar API. So. Um, it takes me to the Explore page, uh, which is also one of the um, most important pages in Lumigo. The Explore page um, lets you search and filter through all of the events that happen in your serverless application, including maybe um, HTTP requests that happen and Lambda requests and also AppSync requests. So this, for this specific query, what I want to do is search for events of AppSync and for the API ID of this specific webinar and let's say, I want to um, search for maybe the second resolvers that we've seen before. There is a snippet here that tells you how you should um, how you should search in this page. Basically, this page is uh, based on the Lucene syntax of Elasticsearch. What I can do here is I can do something like and resolvers dot name um, get lambda two, which is the second resolvers that you've seen before, and. What I'm getting here is the requests that had the result, the specific resolvers participated in them. And then I could do even something um, more interesting. I can search for all of the requests that had get Lambda 2 resolvers in them and also had errors in them. So I can do end resolvers dot error um, any. And this will give me the requests that had the get lambda two in them and had errors in them. This is all of the requests. I can sort this page um, um, by the start time of the events and I can sort this page using the duration. Maybe if I want to um, to see how, how long did each request that had error took, maybe how is the error affecting my latency? And so, um, once I've um, I found the request that looks interesting to me, um, let's say this one, I can see here in snippet um, many more details about the requests, such as the event that was um, that was triggered in the request. And I can see um, a list of the resolvers that participated in this request. And all of these fields are searchable. I can even um, join them into my search. Um, let's say I want to explore this specific uh, request. So what I want to do is I'm opening this request here, which takes me to the transaction page um, and it opens me the um, the the very request that was in AppSync that had the uh, the get lambda one um, resolver and the get lambda two resolver the get dynamo db and the AppSync uh, itself and so you can see here that um, I can see the the map of services that participated in my request as well as the logs that was uh, printed to CloudWatch and you can see here um, many more details if you click on the components itself you can see. If you click on the on the in the icon here, you can see the event that was triggered, and you can see here the duration um, and also the logs. You can you can click on each resolver and see the event that was triggered and their return value. And as you can see, this one is marked with red because it had um, an exception that was raised that says boom. And also, if you had any stack trace, that will be joined to the um, this section right here. This, um, this section of the transaction page also um, offers the timeline view, which gives you, um, you know, the latency breakdown of the services participated in the request, which is also something very interesting in terms of finding uh, maybe something that is um, slower than usual, or maybe something that, um, um, that was oddly um, um, weird comparing to other uh, requests in this session. So, um, yeah, this is how you can debug um, the. Um, this is how you can debug your AppSync application. And that's it, um, Jan. Back to you. Cool. Thank you, Guy. Um, so we've got a few more questions. Uh, so 
two questions here from Achilles. Uh, what about caching? Any tips client side? So we've talked about, about caching already in terms of uh, tips on the client side. Um, I can't think of too many, uh, but I guess uh, a lot of the uh, GraphQL client libraries also do its own caching as well. So you actually have a client side caching um, for requests uh, for, uh, for, for, uh, for requests and responses uh, that uh, you, can, you can take advantage of, uh, but you still want to implement those caching on the absent layer anyway, so that uh, you, know, you, you can scale your caching to multiple users. So in our example, even if an individual um, a user, um, user caches the information, the, 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 the metadata about individual sports, even you know you still want to cache the data so that you don't have to hit Dunham DB every single request anyway, uh, which uh, really helps drive uh, drive down the cost for Dunham DB at scale. Uh, that particular app we launched uh, with about uh, think fifteen thousand uh, users or DAUs, and uh, uh, when we launched with the first, like within the first month, and we had got to about two hundred fifty thousand requests uh, per day on average. And that first month, our bill was about sixty uh, dollars, uh, and uh, thirty six of them was like the eight absent caching because uh, the smallest cash node you, uh, you can have uh, is you know, it's about thirty six dollars a month. Uh, but you know, our down DB cost was like four dollars. Uh, our lambda cost was zero because uh, you know, we had a ninety nine percent cash hit rate. Uh, so basically, most of the requests just got soaked up by the um, absent caching and so we didn't you know we didn't get enough land invocations to even go out of the free tier um, so that's kind of just shows you how much you can save uh, in terms of uh, you know DB and the other costs if you can do you can you can have uh, come up with a really good caching strategy um, another one another question from Achilles is do you, do you use the uh, amplify framework libraries for uh, with AppSync? Are you I don't use so Amplify is multiple things, right? Um, you've got the client side library, which I do use, especially for uh, authentication and stuff like that. Um, the Amplify service for doing CI CD for your single page application, uh, that I also use, uh, which just makes deploying you know, front end applications uh, pretty simple, uh, really straightforward. Um, the Amplify CLI that I don't use, I provision resources uh, using uh, um, service framework. And uh, I've also seen people do that with uh, um, CDK as well. Uh, I don't use the Amplify uh, CLI because it makes uh, too, much decision, too many decisions for me. And I don't always agree with them. And there's no escape patch. Once you start the project using Amplify CLI, it uh, becomes really hard to get out of it as you grow out of uh, Amplify and need to do more custom stuff. Uh, it becomes really difficult to do that. Um, as for the Amplify framework libraries, uh, I, get, I, I guess it depends on what you mean. If you mean the, uh, the component libraries and things like that, then the, yeah, uh, the front end projects I work with, uh, they also do that, they also use that as well. Um, got a question from uh, Zhang Da Zhu here. Uh, is API key the way to support public or unauthenticated APIs for AppSync? If so, how do we deal with the one year expiration limit? I think you actually asked the same question on the AppSync Masterclass forum, and I think I answered that there. So essentially, you could use API key uh, to simulate unauthenticated users. Um, but I don't tend to do it myself. I tend to instead use a Cognito Identity Pool, which can issue IM, uh, IM authentic uh, credits, sorry, credentials uh, for unauthenticated users. And then I can use those to make a request to AppSync uh, and sign the request using AWS uh, uh, IAM. So there's no, there's no expiration limit uh, with API key in that case. Uh, there is the additional overhead of uh, creating identity pool and uh, setting up IAM role and that unauthentic and that unauthenticated the role. Uh, and there's also additional overhead for the front end to actually authenticate, well, not authenticate, but to ask for uh, ask for uh, 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 credentials from community user pool uh, as an on un, um, unauthenticated user, uh, but that's usually the way I'll do it um, for supporting unauthenticated or public API endpoint. Um, got another question here from uh, Sudaka. How can we achieve a tenant isolation with AppSync? Um, so I actually wrote a blog post on this uh, a while back. Essentially, you uh, you basically apply many of the same practices. So like in your DAM DB table, you have uh, uh, 
tenant ID as your, as your primary key. And the important detail here is that the users that you, uh, that you create in the Cognito, they always have a tenant ID as a custom attribute. And in your schema, you never accept a tenant ID as an argument. And instead, when the request comes in, uh, you rely on the fact that the, the, um, the tenant ID was set as a custom attribute that is not mutable. So that once it's been set, you have some process for creating users in Cognito uh, when a user registers themselves in your system. And, uh, and so once that's set, that tenant ID is, uh, is, is, um, uh, is, is immutable and every single request that goes from uh, the user to the backend is gonna, be, is gonna contain that tenant ID as a custom claim. And your API will use that tenant ID attribute uh, to query databases and whatnot. So you can only fetch data for, uh, for your current tenant. You can't fetch data for any other, uh, anybody else. That's how I normally do multi-tenancy uh, with AppSync and the Cognito. Um, got another one here from Luis uh, for custom authorization as an AP in API Gateway Lambda authorizer. Would you suggest using API Gateway apps plus AppSync or just AppSync with a pipeline resolver? It depends. Uh, pipeline resolvers is actually um, a bit tricky. So it depends how, I guess it depends how easy it, um, uh, well, let's see, that's probably not easy, probably not the right way. So I guess depending on a specific use case, because remember with API Gateway's uh, Lambda authorizer, the, you can return a policy that determines uh, what endpoint the user can hit, but AppSync has got one endpoint. <laughs> Um, so if you need to do more sort of fine-grained control in terms of, okay, this user signed in and he can only access this particular endpoint uh, or, or this action, then the, you can't just rely on the, the uh, Lambda authorizer to do that job for you. You have to still use the pipeline resolvers. So depending if the case is just, okay, either uh, yes uh, or nothing, uh, you just have to integrate with some other third-party vendor, then Lambda Authorizer is, is a good way to go. Uh, even if you do something a bit more sort of uh, fine-grained, then the, you have to use a pipeline resolver. Um, the, the overhead of using a pipeline resolver is that uh, you've got 100 uh, 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 GraphQL uh, resolvers, the operations, then the, you end up with 100 uh, uh, the changes you have to make to make all of them um, pipeline functions instead. So what I tend to do in those cases, I will have a LAMP, sorry, um, server framework plugin that essentially takes my existing schema, no pipeline is over uh, at all, and then rewrites the, uh, the scheme, uh, re rewrites the, the confirmation template to inject and to turn all of them into a pipeline function and inject my authentication um, pipeline function into that configuration. So that's how I tend to do that. Um, Another question uh, from Achilles is the behavior of identity pool and signing with AWS uh, 4 not included out of the box on the Amplify SDK framework? Um, I think you can use, uh, if you're using Amplify, then yes, I think it can provision uh, identity pool and all of that for you. But I think it only does it for social signing. I don't know if it does it for unauthenticated users. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so uh, so I'm not sure. Um, uh, it, 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 might, it might do. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but that was, of course, if you use Amplify in the first place, uh, which, as I said, I don't I don't use uh, I don't use Amplify for a production project uh, because um, you always hit a wall um, in terms of what you what you can do with Amplify, and then uh, we need to customize something it becomes uh, more and more difficult. And so I've had a lot of people have to basically start from scratch. Uh, once you get to that point, uh, which is uh, not something I want to deal with uh, for a client project. Um, so I think those are all the questions that uh, we got. So, um, so yeah, I think we're happy to wrap up now. Okay, great, Jan. Thank you very much. And uh, um, of course, thank you, Guy, as well. Uh, sorry for the uh, a bit of choppy audio in the middle, but uh, that's how Wi-Fi is. And uh, of course, all of you are invited to lumigo.io to check out uh, our AppSync support and in general, several uh, serverless monitoring. Bye-bye. <laughs>